Our next speaker is the author of Leisure Commons and The Next Billion Users, digital anthropologist and professor at the Erasmus University Rotterdam. Please welcome Payal Arora. All right, hi everyone. Starting with, I'm going to be talking about the next billion users and irrational design. Now I'm going to start with a story. I basically teach a course on AI for good at a university in the Netherlands. And one of the topics of the class was basically about Intel's latest trail guard, okay? Which is basically an AI device which alerts uh, rangers when a poacher is entering a wildlife sanctuary in Africa. So this way, the rangers can get in time and prevent the killing of endangered species. So the exercise for the class was here, is that how can we enhance this given device and design to amplify doing good, right? So the, you know, the kids basically split up into groups and discussed it over a period of 10, 15 minutes and came together. And uh, you know, a number of good ideas came about, but there was one singular idea that ran across groups, which was, the best way we could enhance this device was to couple it with a drone technology which can shoot to kill. Again, I'm mentioning shoot to kill the poacher, right? After all, I mean, the rangers may not make it in time and you don't want to have a species being dead, right? So I paused and changed context and I told the kids, I said, all right, I told these students, imagine now you're in Amsterdam and we see this cute little kitten, right, sitting there. Oh, it's so cute. And you see this Dutch guy with this, like, hammer that's going to bash the shit out of this kitten, right? Should the Dutch police shoot the guy? The students looked at me as like, are you insane? It's just a kitten. I mean, what about human rights? And the guy, it's a human being, and we have Dutch laws, and we're in Europe. Okay, so I said, so what's the difference between this guy and the poacher? in um, Africa, total silence. What we have here is an issue of empathy, right? Clearly some people enjoy more empathy than others. Is that because, you know, people are just uncaring in general? Absolutely not. It's because empathy is not something that you're born with and that you're just given. It's something you have to build, you know, on a constant basis through a deep understanding of people's motivations, a user group's like socioeconomic context, and other elements which can enable you to make sense of their actions, right? But the problem is that the typical user that we have been using and designing for looks something like this. In fact, this has been a very typical user group that has shaped design for decades, if not generations, across industries. And I, I mean, you know, look at the healthcare in the United States. 85% of clinical trial patients are white, middle class, and male. In fact, handsets like this are designed for the palm of a man. Temperatures, I'm wearing a sweater here, right? Uh, urban office design is set to a male metabolic rate. I can go on uh, and on, like crash test dummies for car accidents are by default male. So what we have here is an information glut of a particular user group and an information deficit of the rest of the world, particularly those in the global south at the margins, or what I call the marginalized majority. So I wrote a book to address this urgent problem. I'm a digital anthropologist, which is just a fancy way of saying that I am studying how people use and understand you know, technologies and embed it in their everyday lives, right? So I've been doing this for over a decade, looking at low-income populations in India, Brazil, South Africa, China, Namibia. And, you know, after this, the goal of my drive, really, was to humanize this massive majority of the world's public. 
And it comes at an interesting time where they have now become of central interest to many different business industries, right? In fact, for good reason. Why? Because of the cheap data plans and uh, cheap mobile phones. They are expected to be the future biggest data consumers and producers, and that's absolutely valuable in this data-based economy, as you've just heard with the panel before. So who are these next billion users? Well, for starters, they're young, a good part of them, sometimes 35%, and in some parts of Africa, as high as 50 to 60% of the population. Uh, they live outside the West, if you're talking about 85%. And the common thread here across board is they come from a low-income segment, but they're absolutely madly in love with mobile technologies, right? They also live in places like this, which are informal, often illegal settlements. We're talking about one billion of the world's population live in settlements like this, which basically, because of their illegal status often, are invisible to the state and have been irrelevant to the market for the longest of time because they were too high risk. And by 2030, these guys are gonna double we're going to have 2 billion in places like this because of the growing global inequality. And these spaces are governed by other types of entities like militia, drug laws, and a whole parallel economy. So when we talk about, talk about governance and regulation, we need to keep that in mind. And the space is more male than female for a number of reasons, right? Um, Partly it has to do with a gender pay gap, something like 17%, and it could go much higher in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Partly it's to do with social cultural norms, because women are expected to use technologies for more pragmatic ends, like call up when you're reaching home, or check your child's uh, education, uh, health care, versus you know, boys who are given much more freedom. And then partly it's by choice, and this is the most insidious of it all. A recent Intel report stated that women's mobile uptake is on the decline in many of the regions in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Why? Because of the growing toxic masculinity, misogyny, hate speech, revenge porn, and the list goes on. So it is really, we've made the space extremely dangerous for them, right? And of course, I think many of you have heard about the pyramid of the needs. Across the day, I've seen people allude to it. And basically, I bring this up because even though it's a theory, which is Maslow's theory from the 1940s, which has thoroughly been debunked, right? It is still one of the most influential templates which are used by policymakers, business thinkers, and lay people to understand this massive marginalized majority, the world's global poor. So basically, this theory goes like this, that if you are poor, surely you first use your resources, your scarce resources, to meet the most basic needs, right? Like uh, your uh, physical needs, your psychological needs, and only at the eventual end, you will put emphasis on self-actualization. I recommend to all of you, you need to throw this template forever into the garbage bin and be done with it. Because we need to turn the pyramid on its head and think about a different paradigm. And I'm offering you a 5F sort of approach to NBU-centered design. Fun, flexibility, fusion, friction, and fabulousness. So let me get started. Fun, right? So when we design you know, tech for low-income segments, if we usually look at farmers and like, surely they want a lot of our creativity channeled into farmer apps so they can check crop prices. Or if it's women, uh, healthcare, because they need to, and fertility planning and family planning. So let's design our content and our apps for that purpose. Or children for education apps. But guess what? These guys are very much like you and I. What they do for the most part with the data uh, being they seek for entertainment, they seek for romance, socializing, gaming, and yes, a lot of pornography. So in some sense, it really shouldn't surprise you because in fact, I would go as far as saying that 
uh, the internet is their only leisure economy. And we cannot fault them for that because rather than looking at it as so irrational in a way in which they're using their precious data, we need to understand that this is an essential coping mechanism for the tediousness of their everyday lives. Picture an auto rickshaw driver stuck in traffic for hours, or someone in a factory for, you know, 14 hours, you know, or a watchman standing outside, not using his potential capacity, right? Extraordinarily dehumanizing tasks. So it's extraordinarily rational, actually, to find a sort of escape mechanism to remind yourself that you're human. Flexibility, right? So unpredictability is very much part of in the next billion users' lives. They don't know when the next paycheck's coming from, when they have to move to another city in search of a job, when do they have to leave their family, when will the next health uh, issue strike when they uh, go bankrupt, right? There's basically, we're talking about a constant instability and constant uh, constraints on choices. So if you are going to design for them, you need to really school yourself into the numerous constraints that they face. But equally important is the study the ingenuity and the ways in which they go about satisfying their needs in spite of these constraints. They both need to be done so you cannot be, you know, because otherwise we come up with sort of paternalistic models. And we do not work with them to figure it out and figure out good design. All right? So also, we need to remind ourselves that a lot of them are also teenagers with teen desires, which basically makes them extremely motivated and ingenious to maximize the, the technologies given and also to play around with ways in which they can uh, self-actualize, right? Because look, these are teenagers, and then that becomes very rational when you think about them in a psychological state. They are at a peak point where they're trying to discover themselves and they're looking for love, looking for affirmation, they're discovering their sexuality, right? And so they're willing to take extraordinarily high privacy risks to do that, to curate themselves in public, to go extraordinarily public when we are talking about so much about, uh, you know, uh, privacy, right? And remember, we are talking about a lot of them live in extraordinarily conservative societies where arranged marriages are the norm. Less than 2% of the population have a love marriage. Also, when you see companies like, say, Spotify, you know, looking at emerging markets and moving into them, it's not enough to just translate the language and come up with some, you know, uh, indigenous languages and indigenous music and local like Bollywood and uh, Tollywood and say, look, that's customization for you, right? For example, their monthly plan needs to go because how can this monthly plan scale when majority of users have uh, pay, uh, their pay on a day-by-day -day basis, right? Or their family plan. What is a family when you see thousands of Bangladeshi migrants moving to Dubai in search of their jobs to support their families back home? Or a lot of the farmers moving from Almora, where I first researched, to Delhi, leaving their families behind and not seeing them for the whole year? Or, you know, the, in China, the rural areas, a number of families are completely broken over generations moving into the urban area due to the huku system, which is a quota system of how many people can enter the urban area, right? And I can go on and on. Filipino nurses moving to Canada, leaving their families behind. The family unit is extremely precarious. So when you come up with a family plan, you need to understand it needs to be flexible in terms of your urban tribe, the eight other people you're sharing a room in, in the, at the factory uh, station, right, where you have bunk beds. That's the picture we need to have. Fusion, right? So fusion is something which is really worth also understanding is that we are in a very interesting time period. We are experiencing a real divergence between the West and the rest. So while the United States is talking about the breaking up of tech oligarchs, right, in the elections, 
Um, and Europe is talking about breaking up the data sets to protect individual privacy. What's happening in China? China is doubling down, actually. That's how it has been able to be the single most strong contender against Silicon Valley because they have scarce resources. So what they did was let's just up it up, right? Let's put Amazon, roll it with Google, roll it with Facebook and another thousand other apps and create this mega digital ecosystem within which you can play. So, and this is extraordinarily advantage with the, the fact that they're right now at the forefront of 5G networks and they plan on conquering the AI world and they're well ahead in the game, right? So it's an interesting sort of trajectory and the global south, whether we like it or not, is heading the way of China. Why? Because it's many of the countries still continue to be poor low income and scarce resources. And you cannot compete with Silicon Valley unless you really have a strategy. And what's the strategy of the Global South? Population, so data is number, and that's one. The other is pool your resources and make this into a sort of a, a multi-intersection of data sets which can give you the smartest, most highest quality data, right? At the price of privacy, at the price of transparency, there's a lot of prices you're paying. But remember, these are trade-offs, and I'm just saying these are the realities of where these two are heading, right? So when you're designing, you're really designing for this mega ecosystem and to be within a walled garden and how people can hop apps and really literally live their lives across board. Friction. So friction is a really interesting point, is that in one sense you can think about design as an art of effortlessness, right? An art of effortlessness. On the other hand, you can say that friction, a little friction can go a long way in protecting people from themselves. So we have 1.7 billion people who are unbanked, who are being lured into the fintech industry. And we need to be really careful because we need to inscribe and encode pause into before action. So pause before action. Why? Because if we see the legacy of microfinance uh, institutes and the way in which it has played out with some extraordinarily like predatory practices, we need to be very careful because we are infringing on the trust. So we have to slow down because these people are learning a banking culture and they need to be eased into it to earn their trust because then it can backfire if we make it so easy that they can get into deeper debt than ever before, right? Now, sometimes good friction, I mean, maybe in disguise. So like consent appears like good friction, right? And in fact, it's a hallmark of the GDPR laws, the privacy laws of Europe, right? So in fact, how it's translated is a nonstop spamming. We need to look at consent in a very careful light because consent in environments with little choice is not really consent. You can look at the app that was designed in Saudi Arabia, which allowed husbands to track their wives, right? In the guardianship system, which I have to say, thankfully, it's just been dismantled. But they did design this app so husbands could track their wives, and this was in compliance with the state laws, and it was consensual by the wives. You have a case that you all know in India, right, where the headmaster put a boxes on the students so as to prevent the kids from cheating. And uh, when he was interviewed and said, why did you do something this crazy, right? He said, but they consented, right? They consented. So consent without meaningful choice is really meaningless. And we need to keep that in mind. And last but not least is fabulousness. Now this seems like the most decadent of it all, right? Look, these are poor people. Why would they want more? Why would they want the fabulous? They should be happy with the necessities. Or like I saw Nokia has just launched 
uh, a new phone with a 4G network, and they very proudly say that it looks like any ordinary crappy phone, but it's not. That's not going to do very well because people want to con be conspicuous consumers. In fact, there's a generation upon generation, we have studies to prove that the low-income populations are conspicuous consumers. And what I mean by that is that even though they're poor, they actually spend disproportionately more on luxury goods than you and I would. Makes absolutely no sense, is it? Did you know that they spend more in terms of the percentage of their income on their data plans than you and I? So that is a fact of life because the data plans, even though it's really cheap, is still a luxury good. So um, there are a couple of reasons. One is it's a signal for status because in conditions like this, sometimes perception can become reality. And we have studies to prove across board around the globe that this pattern keeps happening. There's another reason is dignity. And let's not ever undermine that. People are very proud. And so they're willing to let go of a lot of needs and survival uh, aspects for something fabulous. If you look at Shenzhen, right, which is a Silicon Valley of uh, China and used to be sort of a back office and now really grown and become an entity of its own, but in the earlier days when they were selling to all these low-income people and sort of hacking these phones, uh, they really, they realized, because, you know, if you picture, if someone, how many of you guys have been to Shenzhen? A few of you guys. So you know what I'm talking about. It's like really compressed. There's stores, like, it's like a piracy mall, right? You enter and there's like all these piracy shops. How do you compete? So they actually, some of them came up with this brilliant idea. They're like, Asians love gold. So let's make it a gold phone, because even though they're poor, they're going to buy it, because it'll stand out. And it's sold like hotcakes. 12 years later, Apple launched their first gold phone in the Chinese market, 12 years later. So, you know, this goes across board. You know, you, you read about studies about why are the elderly rejecting hearing aids when they particularly need it. There's a lot of emphasis on what's wrong with these old people. Are they stupid? Are they senile? Well, the truth is that even though they desperately need it and they can't even hear, they will still reject these devices. And this is a real major concern, by the way, by doctors who are sort of flabbergasted by it. And the studies have shown is that people think it's ugly and it makes them look old. It, it's all clunky and it's, it's, it, they don't want to wear the age on their sleeve. In fact, they have a lot more in common with the next billion users. Next billion users do not want to wear their poverty on their sleeve. They want products that can let them blend in with the rest of us, just like the elderly. Paternalistic design will, is bound to fail, right? Nobody wants to be condescended to. So to wrap up, the logic of the irrational is really to humanize design. We need to really put empathy in the loop, which basically means that we need to you know, expand our, our, the quality and the breadth of data on majority of users that we don't know much about. Because if we go by the West dictates, we all are constantly in an information glut. And I really want you to steer away from that because we are actually in the global south facing an information deficit. The normalizing of diversity. We don't need a typical user. We need a spectrum of users because we have a massive population. We can cater to multiple needs. And in fact, there is a lot of diversity, strength and diversity. And let's go global by default, right? Because you're not really building local products for local people. Because there is, do you know how many people see themselves as global citizens? A BBC report recently uh, stated that well, they did a massive survey across the world, and they found that people in Germany, for example, less than 30% of them claim to be global citizens. But Asia, like India, Philippines, Vietnam, Africa, 80% or 85% said they were global citizens. What does that mean? It's because they're aspirational consumers. They see themselves as part of something bigger because they want an alternative script to the ones given to them. And lastly, we need to frictionalize action 
We need to be thoughtful in our ethical sort of slowdowns so we can be responsible in our design and thereby invest in a trust economy. Thank you very much.